Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Amina and I'd absolutely love it if you could press the subscribe button which is just down there and don't forget to press the bell button as well to stay notified whenever I post which is by the way on a Monday and also a Thursday at approximately 6 to 7 p.m. in the evening. GMT. I recently posted a video talking about how I got four A stars. A lot of you were surprised to find out that I actually did English literature um, in my A levels and I absolutely loved it. It was something that I found quite simple and I feel like the reason why I found it simple is because I mastered the techniques that I needed in order to revise and in order to remember the information for the exam and know how much information to remember. I've written down my top 10 tips for how to study for English literature for A level or even for GCSE, this is the exact same thing that I did for both my A levels and my GCSEs and hopefully it gives you some exposure to the things that I do. So number one, make sure that you have read the whole text alone. Now the reason why this is so important is because when you read it in class, you're reading a page or two pages or three pages at a time, it's quite kind of chunky, it's quite bitty and then you come back to it after a couple of days or after a week and it kind of you don't really get that natural flow and this takes away from the overall message and the overall feel that a book gives you if you read it in kind of bite-sized chunks here and there so it is really important to make sure that you read it by yourself in whole and that is the first thing that you do before you even do anything else and I know this sounds like such an obvious um, thing to say but a lot of people do not read their text, they just kind of stick to the main sections or the main parts that you've been advised to look at. But really it's so important and so fundamental that you actually read the text and understand the story. Then the second thing that you need to do is find a summary of that text. Now I highly recommend the Spark Notes, I'll leave their link down below. Um, I used this when I was in GCSE and also in A level, so it's been around for a little while now. It's a great website that allows you to identify themes, summaries, literary techniques, it gives you kind of a nice revision guide in a way for different texts. A lot of the texts that we read um, for English literature, GCSE and A level are quite inaccessible in their English, they're quite old. Shakespearean English, it's quite hard for us to understand their English. So go away and read a summary of your text to get an understanding and a feel of what it was that you've just read. <laughs> um, and then I recommend you to actually write your own summary. So far all we're doing is really feeling the text and really understanding it and really being able to know what it's talking about because without that it becomes very very difficult to write an essay about the theme of love or the theme of anger or the theme of aggression. It's very difficult if you don't understand the context and where that's coming from and you know why this character is feeling that way if you just read kind of chunks and bits of the text. The third thing that you should do is list all the themes that that text has. So for example, I'm going to stick to Macbeth, is a popular one, I think that's the one that I did for my A-levels if I'm not mistaken. So in Macbeth there are a number of different themes. For example, romance is a theme, foreshadowing is a theme, power is a theme, or even ambition. So there are different themes that are predominant in different texts. So again, Spark Notes is amazing because it really gives you the in-depth themes that there are running through those texts, um, and even, I'm not sure if it is for poems, but definitely for text. They give you those themes, and those are what make up exam questions. So an exam question might say, um, describe or talk about, write about the theme of ambition in Macbeth in the first scene or the second scene. For example, with foreshadowing, there are certain occurrences um, in the beginning of the play, or maybe even the weather, or the setting, the environment, which determine and kind of foreshadow what's going to occur in the future. And maybe what would be a good idea is to read over that text again or read different sections of that text in order to identify those themes. So you might not have realised that foreshadowing is a theme in Macbeth until you went to Spark Notes. But now that you know, you may read that text again and you might be able to identify different parts of that text that actually do exhibit foreshadowing. Um, and you hadn't realised it before because you didn't realise that was a theme. So the fourth thing that I did is to find quotes that strongly support each theme. Now, it doesn't matter if you, again, don't feel too confident in identifying these. Go to Spark Notes. They give you all the detail and all the information that you need. If you have identified a quote that you feel is very powerful in showing foreshadowing in Macbeth, why not try to just read a bit around that quote, understand where it just came from, understand what was before and after it, what, you know, why is it in that placement? 
And the fact that you can only focus on two or three quotes per theme kind of narrows down a lot your, the information that you're learning and it's impossible for you to memorize a whole play. It just doesn't happen. And if you don't go into the exam knowing those main quotes, then I think you've done yourself an injustice. Um, and a The next thing that I did was to also find two or three quotes that really supported the characteristics of different characters. So you should know and have, li have a list of the top five or the main kind of six, seven characters. I'm sticking to Macbeth again, but you may be asked about a specific character and how that specific character contrasts to another character or how that character displays a theme so you do need to be able to remember quotes for themes but also remember quotes for specific characters and how that character car carries <laughs> how that character carries themselves and how that character was kind of portrayed in, in, in that play or in that novel when you sit there in the exam and you need to describe a, a theme you have those characters in your head, you know what describes them, you have the evidence and the quotes to be able to, you know, back up your statements, um, and this will lead you to gaining those higher marks. Saying this character was powerful because he did this and that is not as strong as saying this, pow this character was powerful because he did this, here's the quote, here's my explanation. So you know PEE, -E, your point, your evidence, your explanation, just giving a point by itself doesn't lead you to getting those higher grades as if you did the point and then you explained and, and you also backed it up with it. The next thing that I did was to look at past paper questions. Now this is a tip that I give all the time. Past paper questions, past paper questions, past paper questions. Um, but in English it's even more important because you don't necessarily know what kind of questions you might be asked. Whereas in maths it's quite obvious. You do it, you, you learn how to do, you learn how to do Pythagoras and then you, you get questions on Pythagoras. Whereas in English, there are different themes that examiners can ask you about. So if you make a bank of questions for yourself based on past paper questions, then you kind of have an idea of what type of themes can be questioned. Try to go as far back as you possibly can. I would go back 10, even 15 years if you can find papers from 2010 and just write them down in, in, a, in like a Word document. This is a question, this is a question, this is a question. The next thing I did with that information is then to plan my answers for each question. Do not write an essay, do not do it at this point. At this point, just plan your essays. So planning is very, very, very important in English literature. And examiners can see that you've planned or that you haven't planned. And imagine, this examiner doesn't know who you are, they don't know that you're academically excellent, they don't know what you've done, they don't know anything. All they see when they open your paper is a plan. And they're going to think, wow, this person is really intelligent, this person is really organised, this person is planning their thoughts and writing down a structure, so I expect that this essay is going to be structured, right? If an examiner were to just see an essay just written with no plan, it gives the examiner the impression that you haven't planned and you haven't thought about your answer. So try to get the examiner on your side from the beginning and show them a plan. And if I'm not mistaken, some examples do give you marks for plans or do give you slight advantages for having a plan. Don't quote me on that, but I would highly recommend you doing a plan. As an examiner myself, when I see a plan and when I see working out and when I see people that have shown that they are thinking about something, it makes me feel more confident in the fact that their answer is well thought about and that their answer has depth. If you never plan and you only write essays, when you go to the exam, even though you might think that you need to plan, you won't necessarily know how to, or you won't necessarily know how, w what the best plan looks like and how to plan a, an English essay. Let me know, by the way, if you want to know how to plan an English essay. Read isn't difficult at all, um, but if you do want that video, do let me know and I will make it in the next couple of weeks. Then what I did, when I felt like I was able to plan and I felt like I knew the, the main quotes, the main bits of information, the main themes, I then started to actually write the essays um, under timed conditions. So I'd time myself, give myself 90 minutes or 60 minutes or whatever, however long your exam is, I'd time myself, give myself a question and some paper and just get on with it and write it. I used to write one essay a week, um, I would say from now, maybe from like next month, one essay a week, that means that 
in March you'll write four essays, in April you'll write four essays, and then come May you've written almost ten essays, which is I think really good for your revision alongside everything else that you're doing. I think one thing that I find um, as an examiner, again, marking essays, I find that students tend to write really well and then at the end it's just like, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like it's been rushed, you can tell that it's been rushed. It's so important that you don't write to the last minute. You have to go back and give yourself a good 10 minutes, I would say even more, to be able to go back, edit your essay, rewrite bits, you know, cut out bits. You might have thoughts about new quotes, stick them in, um, check spelling, grammar, punctuation, of course, all those English techniques. And then for those that are aiming for, you know, level 8s, level 9s, A's, A stars, you do need to try to hit as many AOs as you can, so as many assessment objectives as you can. The main one that gets you to that top top mark is being critical and showing critical analysis and critical thoughts. No one actually explained this to me ever, which is very frustrating seeing as every feedback marking that I got always said be critical, critical, critical and I, and I never actually knew what that meant all the way up until university. I only truly understood it during my PhD, which is very frustrating. What it means is basically giving your original thoughts, trying to conflict two arguments together, trying to you know, show the limitations or try to give a different point of view. Original, basically being original. But what you can do is try to think about original thoughts before you actually get into the exam. So I know that it can be quite hard in the exam to think of something original, you know, on, on the spot. But I would say to give yourself a little heads up when you are planning those essays that I just mentioned in the previous point, what you can do is think about putting a little section at the bottom of your plan saying, my original thought will be this. What can I say that's unique here? This is something that you do have to think about a little bit and a little bit of depth. And that's why I said it's very important for you to actually have read the text yourself in full because it's only that way that you can actually find that information and, you know, make those connections. If you've just read the main bits, likelihood is you won't be able to make those original connections. Those are my top tips. I did think about it for a while. I sat down for about half an hour and I was pondering over what was it that I did. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give me a huge thumbs up and don't forget to press the subscribe button if you haven't already. You should have by now. Hello to everyone that's joined recently. It's been amazing to have so many more of you join this channel. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye!